Welcome to Insights and Indicators. I'm Jason Thomas, Carlisle's Head of Global Research and Investment Strategy. In this podcast, I share our observations and opinions on the economic landscape, as well as insights from research being conducted by our team here at Carlisle. Today, I'll share some thoughts focused on what we're seeing in the U.S. This episode was recorded on February 23rd, 2024, and the discussion reflects composite portfolio data and analysis of recent government reports that are accurate as of that date. So in addition to data, our portfolio supplies anecdotes, discussions with management teams that can be as important to understanding macroeconomic developments as underlying metrics. I think there's really two important meta observations or inferences that can be drawn here. First, the pandemic clearly awakened something. What I mean by that is management teams today, most of whom have spent their entire careers in a low inflation environment, partly because they'd never pushed on price, are more willing to actually demand price increases from their customers than had been the case before. I think in the period prior to the pandemic, there was always the fear, real or imagined, that some shadow supply existed in their markets that was always ready to swoop in and take away their customers if they raise prices. Then during the pandemic, these same people, same management teams, suddenly found themselves in a position where they were demanding 20 to 30% price increases. And while our data clearly show that those sorts of price increases are a thing of the past, in fact, if we look at our data on input costs, they're actually declining by about 15% annually through the end of January, the memory of that experience remains. And so it's really no surprise to see management teams in many parts of the economy feel emboldened to seek aggressive price increases in areas like insurance premiums whenever the opportunity arises. So again, I think people have to appreciate that the sensitivity of prices to economic conditions is just much greater than we experienced over the last 10 or maybe even 20 years, when there was always this reluctance to raise prices because of, again, fear that the cost in terms of lost sales would outweigh whatever benefits arose. Secondly, I think that it's important to note that the period of peak global capital efficiency has come to an end. And really what I mean by that is not just the increased frictional costs related to cross-border trade and investment flows, related to tariffs, related to export controls, but just the basic realization that the world has become much more complicated. And there's no longer the ability to be, you could say, indifferent about where your components, parts, other inputs, or your broader production processes actually occur. And the period prior to the pandemic was one where there was really just a dramatic unbundling of production processes. You had products designed in one place. You had components and parts that were produced elsewhere. Very often it was spec manufacturing agreements. And then of course you had final assembly that occurred in still another place. And this led to a striking degree of concentration in suppliers among industry participants. Very often for what you consider to be trivial items like air hoses or circuit boards. And so very often there was just a single supplier for an entire market, and they developed economies of scale, efficiencies, drove down costs, and this all seemed very natural. And this indifference to where things were produced, as long as it was at the lowest cost, and again, allowed for increased margins, uh, increased profitability, was something that I think today we can clearly see from the portfolio, it's come to an end there's now just much greater sensitivity to where things are produced, having redundancies in the processes. And this also, I think from the perspective of interest rate determination, means that there's a lot more investment and there's much higher consumption of capital than had been the case previously. And so when you take these two insights together, again, mostly derived from discussions, from anecdotes, from the portfolio, I think we live in a world where the reactivity of prices to increase demand is much higher than has been the case previously, which means managers are willing to press their luck, one could say, 
rather than just assume that any sort of increase in costs is going to be transitory and something to be looked through and that there's going to be competitors that come in whenever prices are increased to take away customers. But I also see a willingness to incur additional costs to insulate supply chains from the fragility revealed during the pandemic. And again, a lot of that is just the, the assumption that all of the necessary inputs would arrive on time. Some of it is related to geopolitical issues, just a sense that things that you were able to obtain from one market are no longer going to be shipped one day in the future because of, of some event that's very hard to forecast or anticipate. And of course, this has meant massive investment in domestic or nearby productive capacity, increased inventories, investment in warehouses to store those inventories. And then at the same time, I think a interest recognition of, and of course, public support for energy transition. And much of that is not just investment in renewable energy sources, but actually in green industry, realizing that the components, parts that existed in, in a different world, when you had internal combustion engines or industrial processes that depended on things like natural gas, other hydrocarbons, are not the sorts of equipment that you need in a future where you're going to have industrial processes where carbon and carbon emissions are a much greater focus. And so industrial investment, which is essentially construction of new facilities related to the industrial sector, made a larger contribution to US GDP in 2023 than has ever previously been observed. And these data stretch back to World War II. And our data suggest that this is continuing not just the level of activity, but the growth in such investment is persisting through the first quarter of 2024. And I think that as we've talked about on previous occasions, expecting rapid and substantial interest rate cuts in this environment, again, given the sensitivity of prices to economic conditions, given the amount of fixed investment that's occurring to create redundancies, more insulated production networks is just fanciful. And over the last few weeks, we've seen that the rate markets have come around to our views. After pricing seven rate cuts as recently as late December, futures markets now expect just three Fed rate cuts in 2024. And this is largely consistent with what we outlined in January, which is that if conditions persist, it'd be more reasonable to expect just two to three cuts. Again, very controversial at the time. Now, actually, the market has almost moved exactly to what we anticipated. I think that the additional complication today is that it's hard to know when these cuts will commence. The Fed has really wanted to avoid wading into the election season. This is something that has been reported publicly, but in general, just cutting rates in the midst of a campaign is something that the Fed really wanted to avoid doing. But, you know, a May cut, and, and I think the most elegant solution to this would have been cutting in May, cutting in June, and then waiting, and then cutting again in December if necessary. That may not be possible. With core inflation that is about 3%, it may be hard to actually act for the first time in May. And so this raises the possibility that if you do expect two rate cuts before the election, the first could still come in June, but the second would then have to arrive at the July FOMC meeting. And that July meeting is scheduled to take place right between the two national party conventions. So, you know, very much in the thick of the election season. And that's not ideal certainly something that the Fed had hoped to avoid. Perhaps it won't be able to. But, you know, I think whatever happens with rates, our data suggests the economy is in pretty good shape. I think first, we see significant growth in what you could describe as tech budgets, just the amount that is allocated by management teams to their technology budget. Much of this is related to AI, of course, but also data, digital services, software, and related applications. I think what's interesting here is that many businesses see a clear use case for AI. 
They see very obviously where this is going to enhance productivity, where this is going to make business sense from the get-go. In other cases, you see people increasing spending in this area simply because they're scared of competitive dynamics. They know everyone else is spending on AI and related applications, and they worry if they don't, they're going to be left behind. So this sort of fear of missing out or fear of the unknown is really an important driver to the spending here, which again is make a material contribution to GDP growth. Secondly, we see again the aforementioned boom in industrial fixed investment construction activity. This is insulating against the fragilities revealed by the pandemic, of course, also energy transition and semiconductors and just other areas where there's clear public support and need for this type of investment. And then finally, we do see quite a lot of spending that I think could be attributed to very large public deficits in the United States. And so the federal government is running a deficit that is in excess of 6% of GDP. The counterpart to the public deficit is essentially the private sector surplus. So that means that households and businesses have after-tax incomes that are, one could say, one and a half trillion dollars larger than they quote unquote should be if there were more sustainable fiscal arrangement or certainly at these levels of very low unemployment. And so the fact that such a large share of resources are being kept among households and businesses is also very much facilitating growth. And I would just conclude by noting that most of these deficits today are being funded not in long-term capital markets, which might crowd out capital availability for the business sector, but in money markets through treasury bill issuance. And so through the 12 months ending in December, Treasury bills actually accounted for about 83% of the net cash raised by Treasury. So Treasury last year in the U.S. had to raise $2.4 trillion. Over $1.9 trillion of that came from bill issuance. And this is quite a disparity to the historic funding mix, where bills actually constitute only about 15 to 20% of the total stock of debt that is funded by the Treasury. So I will conclude there. On behalf of the team here at Carlisle, thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join us again for our next episode of Insights and Indicators.